Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 FM, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and we have a great lineup for you today on the show. I will introduce them in a moment, but first I just want to remind folks who have not tuned in before, we here on the Montpelier Happy Hour talk about how things in the capital shake out for Wyndham County. And for those who also don't know, the views and opinions expressed on the show are those of the contributors and the hosts and not the radio station. So with all that housekeeping out of the way and without further ado, I want to introduce regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro. Hey, Emily. Good morning, Olga. Good morning. And then I also want to introduce both our guests. First is Carrie Brown, and she is the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Welcome, Carrie. Good morning, Olga. Thank you for having me. So glad you can be here. And then our second guest is Professor Stephanie Seguino, and she is a professor at, in the Department of Economics for UVM, as well as a fellow with the Gund Institute for the Environment. So glad to meet you for the first time, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. So Emily, I would love if we could dive in and if you would frame this conversation, because we want to talk about COVID, but also how COVID has impacted women in the economy. And like so many things related to COVID, the apple cart that is being tossed about has been tossed about before (laughs) Um, and probably had a broken wheel when it came to women in the economy in Vermont. Um, so, so let's talk about how we want to dive in here. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Olga. Um, and I think maybe Stephanie and Carrie could both do a better job of this than I can, but I'm going to give it a go, and then maybe they can um, add some flesh to the bones of the metaphor that we're going to keep on riding with here. <laughs> so um, women and the economy and COVID. We know that the majority of essential workers are women. Those folks in caretaking positions, folks in um, low wage jobs, and we've always known that. So that's, you know, on the slightly higher end of the economic spectrum, that's nurses, and then we have childcare providers, we have grocery store workers, we have folks who were struggling economically before and are now in frontline positions, often in a place where they don't necessarily have stable childcare. And so folks who are already economically vulnerable are now both economically vulnerable and physically vulnerable, their health is is, um, at risk. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we're also seeing that the majority of the folks who are now freshly unemployed from COVID are women. And so we have this perfect storm of the the disproportionate impacts that this pandemic is having on women, low wage women, single mothers, et cetera, which is what has happened at every other sort of major um, upheaval in history. You know, we see the recession disproportionately affecting women. We see low wages disproportionately affecting women. We see health crises disproportionately affecting women. And so here we are again, um, and really trying to understand if we are going to move into a positive recovery, what elements of those, pos- what can we put in place for that recovery so that we are fixing some of those um, long-standing discrepancies. And I just want to add a little context for folks. This is from a report by Change the Story that came out in December of 2019. I believe Carrie was involved with it. And it was called Women, Work, and Wages in Vermont. And I just want to quote from it a little bit. So we have some context of where we were going into COVID. Um, So kind of like where the the playing field was or the apple cart was kind of bouncing along, if we're going to stay with that. Um, And this report found that women, especially women of color and women with disabilities, are disproportionately impacted by poverty in Vermont. For example, uh, a single male tends, the number of men who are single living in poverty is around 3.5%, where for single women, no children, um, that number is about 11.4%, much higher. And then if you add children to the equation, a single male head of household, uh, the number in living in poverty is around 16%. Mm-hmm. 
where for single mothers, um, there the number of those households living in poverty is 36.7% according to this report. So that just gives you an idea of where we were heading into COVID and now COVID has, has bloomed uh, even more issues. Um, Carrie, I would love to start with you since we were just quoting from, from that report. Um, what are you seeing and what would you like to see instead? Since we're at a point where we are building a lot of new policy, um, what are some, some baselines you would like to get to? Yeah, well, um, I'm glad you referenced that change the story report because it does give us a good sense of kind of where where we were um, as we went into all this. And that was just to, so that people know change the story is a partnership of the Vermont Commission on Women and the Vermont Women's Fund and Vermont Works for Women. And so we've been working together for a few years to um, do, do research and, and pull together a lot of this data so that we know what the economic situation is for women in Vermont. And um, it, the timing is just fascinating, isn't it? We came up with this latest report mm -hmm. at the end of 2019 and then the beginning of 2020 and suddenly now everything is, is being thrown into such disruption. Um, but what it's really doing is just making it um, so clear the disparities that were already there are they're magnified, they're much worse now, they're, and then we can see how they're going to get worse. And that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, and I think a lot of people are seeing that it's not just that we can see what the numbers are, that women's earnings are lower, um, that more women are living in poverty, that kind of thing, but that we can kind of see some of the structural reasons for this. So when we look at who are the essential workers, and I just gotta say, I love that term because, um, Child care workers, health care workers, people who are in caregiving professions have been trying to tell us all along that they're essential. And now the kind of this greater mainstream terminology has been put on them. But are we actually recognizing them as essential? Do we really understand that they are essential to our economy, that they, they, they're what keeps it all going? And I think there is some understanding of that. But now the question is, are we gonna have policy that recognizes that and that kind of puts it into action? So if we've got 81% um, of tipped workers in Vermont are women and, um, and the majority of childcare workers and nurses and healthcare workers overall are women. The majority of people working in service sector jobs, which, are, which could be personal service, could be you know, home health aides, um, people caring for uh, elderly people, those, the majority of those are women and their wages have been low and their working con conditions have not been great. And um, so I, don't, I won't get into too many details at this point, but I just think that right now we kind of have an opportunity to say, well, if these really are essential occupations, what does that mean and how are we going to recognize that and ensure that they are, that they're economically safe as well as physically health-wise safe and and the, the whole rest of the economy can function. And um, Stephanie, I want to segue to you because uh, Emily shared with me the report that you had recently, or presentation you had recently given to the uh, Women's Caucus, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you talked about uh, in this time how cutting the budget is probably one of the last things we want to do. So talk to us a little bit about why austerity measures, which I think is such a human reaction when we're freaking out to like pull in and make sure our resources are all tightened up, um, why those would be probably one of the worst things to do right now. Yeah, I, I might just give you the economist name for that phenomenon, which is called the paradox of thrift, which says that, you know, we think that it makes sense for individuals to save, but if we all do so at the same time, that it actually has the opposite effect. That rather than saving more, because our saving reduces spending in the economy, it means that businesses lay off more workers because businesses only have workers if they're customers. And so if spending declines, businesses lay off more workers, those workers' incomes decline, 
they therefore spend less and this reverberates throughout the economy so much so that actually savings fall because incomes fall and it's the same with the state budget and i understand burlington is discussing budget cuts as well and the reality is that those are probably going to make the fiscal situations of both the state and the city worse because the you know i i'm using this term that the economy is in an induced coma uh you know sometimes when we cut budgets you know uh it's because we think we've been spending too much in this particular case the only way to save the patient in a coma is to keep the patient alive by spending and so it means that we have to borrow or we have to find other funding sources so that we can keep the patient alive if we don't uh, then recovery will be much slower than it was. Why? Because households will take on enormous debt if they can, and businesses will take on debt or go bankrupt, in which case they won't be there when the recovery begins and when, when the social distancing ends to hire back more workers. So uh, it is, uh, you know, the, the evidence tells us, even conservative economic institutions like the IMF are now saying that austerity is actually bad economics. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so from there, Emily, do you any do you want to jump in with questions? Yeah, I want to add one like, more thread. So we okay. have the essential workers that are still working and that we know need um, to have both more protections and more funding given to them to continue to help both their personal economies grow, their households thrive, and to stimulate the economy further. We have the folks who are laid off because they're in service jobs, um, which is primarily women, and what it will, will take to make sure those folks are employed. We also have a sort of third category of um, women who have historically had lower wages than their male counterparts, but certainly have much higher wages than other women in the economy. Um, sort of middle class professional women who we know historically have had a disproportionate share of the household work and household labor, which has um, been a challenge to their professional careers in whatever way. Um, and we're even seeing now some evidence about, you know, who's publishing. I don't know if you've seen these articles, Stephanie. Um, they're really interesting. Oh sort of who, what, which academics are publishing in quarantine and which ones aren't. And we see men's publishing skyrocketing and women's pub publishing plummeting because the bulk of the childcare burden and the household burden and the cooking burden is now on women. And I, you know, I am surprised every day to see that playing out in my own house where I'm cooking, you know, multiple meals a day when, when I'm up in the legislature in Montpelier instead of in my house, I, you know, spend 20 minutes eating dinner rather than an hour and a half on that activity. And so what we're seeing is as we've paused the economy um, and not taken into account the needs of all of the different people involved in it, whether those were low wage workers out of work, people who are still working, and folks who are um, still working at home, we're seeing those ripple effects in so many different ways that as we step forward into this next future, which maybe is you know, flexible working conditions for all folks, but how are flexible working conditions gonna be used to further exploit women in their childcare capacity and their home capacity? And how are they gonna be used to actually help people move their careers and their communities forward? So I wanna sort of keep those, I think it's really like those three threads of women in the economy that are important to continue through this conversation. Because they yeah. need very different policies. I really appreciate you bringing that up, Emily, because that is one of the key things that women were already facing. One of the key reasons for the disparity in, in earnings that we see in, um, in just that, that disproportionate responsibility for family care and for unpaid work in general. Uh, and so we have a we just launched um, a, 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 a little spot on our website where people can tell us their story or give us, just tell us what's going on for them. And um, right away we, we started getting, we've gotten responses and um, including someone talking about how she's got a baby and um, she, uh, the, the bulk of the childcare is falling on her right now. And as she and her husband are looking to going back to work, and kind of evaluating how is that really going to work without childcare and without and who's earning what that it's starting to look like maybe she shouldn't go back to work at all mm -hmm. and and that 
she's very aware that this is exacerbating gender disparities that were already there. And, um, and I'm, I know that's just the tip of the iceberg that we're going to be seeing down the road. If I might just jump in on that, you know, one of the challenges of that is, you know, uh, in the event of divorce, when women have spent the bulk of their time as the ones staying home taking care of children, mm -hmm. that then leads to even greater gender inequality in, right. in post-divorce, right? Mm -hmm. Because the woman has less uh, job experience, her skills may have atrophied, and so she finds herself in a more precarious situation. And we know that in many cases that women stay in relationships that are not healthy precisely because of that disadvantage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so solving the, um, the care burden, if you will, care of children, care of the elderly, uh, reproducing the family every day through care of the household and so forth is fundamental to gender equality. And one of the challenges is that businesses do not necessarily offer work-family balance. That, and I think um, that is why the legislation for paid sick leave, for paid parental leave, uh, were so fundamentally important. And it's very discouraging that we begin this, we face this COVID crisis without those protections in place for, for women. Uh, I, 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 and I, I, I uh, regret the lack of voice of uh, especially women who are single mothers, for example, at the state level, to be able to sh to be able to inform policy based on their deeper knowledge of this experience. Um, this I, I one day I was riding to the uh, airport in a taxi, and it was a woman taxi driver, and she um, <clears throat> worked uh, for a private uh, group at UVM. Uh, was told that she said, "Look, I, I just need to." Uh, be at home from seven to eight at night uh, because my child has needs and I just need there to be there at the end of the day to help them. Can I leave a little earlier? I'd be happy to come in earlier. I'd be happy to come back and stay later. She lost her job. Uh, we, we cannot, we cannot uh, allow that uh, women face a choice between caring for their children who are our future, who are is an investment that we all need to make and decide on whether to have an income or not. And you know what we're seeing now is extraordinary stress of mothers at home uh, who are not only doing their, those who do have jobs or re working remotely are caring for their kids and homeschooling. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know there is some evidence that men are stepping up who are staying at home that they're taking on more of the care responsibilities, but uh, that hasn't closed the gap. And I'm glad to see that, but it hasn't closed the gap. Paid parental leave, uh, as, as compared to paid maternity leave, is a way to uh, move men into paid care, uh, to unpaid care work at home, for example. But uh, we need to be more forward thinking in our policies here in Vermont that uh, incentivizes business or requires them to take into account work family balance that they haven't and that most most directly disadvantages women and we don't just do that for the equity of it or the you know exactly good spirit of it or because we care about women those are all great reasons to do it but also because if there's more money in the hands of women you know through their lifetime including when we're getting to social security time then we know that that will have a positive impact on the greater economy because prosperity begets prosperity carrie you had something very important to say for a second <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so in 2013, we passed a law in Vermont that you employees are allowed to ask their employers for flexible working arrangements, exactly like what you described, Stephanie. And they are not allowed to be retaliated against for doing that. And so um, I don't know when this happened, this, this story that you were describing, but that is something that is actually illegal now. If someone loses their job because they ask, to be able to flex their schedule a little bit, um, that's against the law. And, and this is a law that not a lot of people in Vermont know about. I don't know that a lot of people are using it, and they certainly don't know that um, what they're supposed to do if that happens to them. Uh, so I would just kind of- What are they sure supposed that, to do if that yeah, happens to them? Yeah, they should call the attorney general's office. And um, if they're, unless they're a state employee, in which case they should call the Human Rights Commission. And everybody else should call the, the attorney general's office. And um, that's exactly the kind of little policy step that we have tried to take to do exactly what you were talking about, Stephanie, which is to, to uh, um, not just encourage, but to kind of put some basic 
boundaries in place for that work-life balance. Um, oh, actually, I hate that term. Forget I said that. <laughs> There's no such thing as work-life balance. <laughs> it's really, it's like a seesaw, you know? It, it goes up and down, and, and the goal of the seesaw isn't to stay level, right? The goal of the seesaw is to go back and forth, so it's okay. But at any rate, um, there, paid family leave, paid parental leave, I mean, I would love to have more of an in-depth discussion about um, that, that point of it's not maternity leave, mm -hmm. it's parental leave, and that we have to, there was, a, the, the, um, there, there were some aspects to the bill that, that recently failed that, um, it's, it, it, as it was being developed, would have encouraged women to take more time than men when they had children, and which was extremely troubling to me, and um, really just a, a, a move backwards from where the rest of the world is going. The rest of the world is moving in the direction of let's try to encourage men to take this, let's try to get as many men to take this as possible, um, because that is where we start to have some shot at equity. When, you know, right now there's a huge motherhood penalty for women in the workforce, Course. They, it, they have children, their earnings go down. Uh, men have children, their earnings tend to go up. Um, there's all kinds of, of detriments to it. And, you know, I think in an ideal world, we would see that there's a penalty, if there's going to be a penalty at all, it's for parents and not for mothers or for fathers. And, and really, in an ideal world, there's no penalty at all because we <laughs> recognize that people need to have children and have families for the species to go on as well as to go to work. But, um, but kind of getting us to that point where it, you're not set back in your career because you're a woman and it's assumed you're gonna have children or because you are a woman and you do have children, um, but that we can, we can make it work for everybody. And key to that is getting men to do as much of the work as women. I think that you know there's an important role for the government in this. Uh, one of my colleagues, Diane Elson at University of Essex, is Essex in the UK, used this, this expression, recognize, reduce, and redistribute in talking about care work. And the challenge has been uh, that care work is invisible, primarily, at least the unpaid portion of it is. And I think that we're a little bit recognizing care work in the paid economy with essential workers right now. Uh, and so her argument is that it's really fundamental for the, the state, uh, i.e. the national government and state governments to recognize the fundamental role of care work in, in contributing to the health of the economy. People who are not well cared for, kids who are not well cared for, become costly in the future and are less productive in the future. So it behooves all of us to, to address this particular issue. Uh, so policies to redistribute care work from, for example, uh, women to men, for example, or to reduce it by providing public alternatives and public funding for care uh, is, are, you know, should be part of the package. And I, I, I think it, it would be much, it would be important for us in Vermont to begin talking about that, this at the level of state government. Uh, and, and framed in that way, this is not a luxury. You know, paid sick leave is not just something we could do because, you know, we can afford it. It, it is fundamental investment in our future. And we have to think about these kinds of expenditures uh, that are investments, just like we might invest in clean water or we might invest in certain industries and so forth that produce a rate of return in the future that make them worthwhile investments. These investments are fundamental. And I, I think we need to frank, change the way that we talk about this as, you know, just kind of a nice thing we do to promote gender equality, but something that we all should be invested in. What I get stuck in, Stephanie, is the fact that when we redistribute care work, um, mm -hmm into either a publicly funded service or a privatized service, that then becomes another mechanism of exploiting women mm -hmm. and as low wage workers then, right? It leaves the household land of exploitation and enters the private sphere of exploitation in the, you know, in the marketplace. And so we have childcare workers right now in Vermont who are either still working or about to, you know, about to re-enter the workplace with very few workplace protections in place still making minimum wage. Sure. So, and that, that would be part of the point that yeah. 
women, uh, people who do childcare work are underpaid. I mean, I always think about, you know, that stockbrokers make, you know, six figures a year, for example, and how valuable is caring for children well compared to that work? So, uh, you know, there are a variety of reasons, but certainly the private childcare sector is the cause, right? And that is that it's more difficult to address the low wages of childcare workers in the private sector. And part of that reason is that, you know, just to, to give you some examples, some friends of mine are in their mid thirties, uh, have two kids, they both have really good professional jobs and they sp spend roughly $24,000 a year on childcare for their two children. I mean- It's actually on the lower end. I, I don't <laughs> you know, even know what yeah. to say about that. Uh, and those childcare workers are not necessarily earning a lot of money. So we need to follow examples like France, which has a sliding scale, publicly funded childcare system. Uh, and there, there are many other mechanisms, but uh, Emily, I couldn't agree with you more that, uh, that we have to address the low wages of childcare workers themselves because it should not be, it is exploitative precisely because women have few options for well-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And also because low wage workers could hardly afford childcare. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to take that on and to address this as a public issue, not just a market issue of, um, you know, private childcare. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. We I, need to go to break, but before we do, Carrie, was there something you wanted to add quickly? Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up on all that childcare and reinforce what you all are saying and that, um, you know, we've figured out how to do this with K through 12 or education. It, and it's, it's not rocket science. <laughs> we know how to do it. And before we go into break, I want to leave our listeners with this thought um, from the happy hour. I remember speaking with a, a principal uh, in one of the Brattleboro schools who has since retired, but he was talking about how poverty is increasing amongst his students and how he as a, a principal is trying to find new ways to care for these students so that they can receive the services they need. And I asked him, why do you think you have seen this increase in poverty, in family stress and that type of thing? And he said, if children are struggling, it's because their families are struggling. Mm -hmm. And if families are struggling, it's because we as a society are not supporting them and not passing policy that helps them. And so I wanted to share that for listeners because I think in some ways that ties in everything we've been, we've been saying here and pointing out that when we are not taking care of the people who care for our children, whether professionally, whether it's privately in a family, then we are seeing the cost down the line. We, we complain about our school budgets being too high. But this is one reason they're high, is schools are taking on a bigger burden of, of some of the services, which can be good, but if there are other policies in place that could prevent that down the line, that would be even better. So we're gonna to head to break here a little bit from our underwriters. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW LP Brattleboro 107.7. We will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you're just joining us, I have on the show with me regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro, as well as Carrie Brown, the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, and professional Professor Stephanie Seguino from the Department of Economics at UVM, as well as she is also a fellow at the Gund Institute for the Environment. Welcome back to the show, Carrie and Stephanie. Thanks. So for folks who are just joining us, as always, our opinions are our own and not the radio stations. And we were talking before the break about a number of the ways COVID is impacting women in the economy, but how so many of these impacts are structural impacts that now we're feeling with the new perspective of COVID, um, but how have been in, impacting women and low wage earners for decades in Vermont. I would love to hear from Carrie and Stephanie, what do you feel is the way forward? You know, we have, uh, Vermont just received one point 
$2.5 billion, that's billion with a B, from the CARES Act, the Federal CARES Act, for COVID response. Uh, Scott has proposed so far of putting $400 million towards an economic relief package for businesses. Um, and the first three, he's talked about what he's going to do with the first $310 million of that, uh, just helping businesses, quote unquote, survive um, through loans and grants. He hasn't talked about the details for the rest of that money so far. So I'm wondering, with this influx of money, with this big boatload of money Vermont has just gotten, where would you like to see that money go to actually reduce gender disparity um, and shore up the economy in the long run? How about well, we start with you, Carrie? Okay, good. Sure. Um, so just tying into the discussion we were just having about childcare a minute ago, um, you know, we have, we've got this whole industry that, that everything else is built on. Um, Stephanie brought up the example of the stockbroker who makes a ton of money. Um, couldn't make that money, couldn't go to work and make that money without childcare. And, and so it's, you know, this, this, this folks at the bottom who are propping up the whole rest of, of the economy. And it, so it's, it's been troubled for a long time. It's, it's been underpaid, it's been unstable. We're relying on, on the money from the pockets of the parents uh, to support the whole thing, which is just not enough. Um, and since this started, the childcare industry in Vermont has gotten a tremendous amount of help from the state. They've gotten these stabilization funds that have helped centers to stay open or to keep their staff employed. So staff are continuing to get paid even when centers are closed. Parents are getting more help with being able to pay their tuition payments to keep their spot going. And that is all going away in, what, nine days or something, the end of, of this month. That, that funding is gone. And um, the center, the child care providers are not in any necessarily better position to be able to do what they were doing. Um, and so now I think it's a really good time to look at that fundamental structure of how we're funding that whole system and make some changes that are not just going to kind of keep, keep folks paying the bills for another month or so, but to find ways so that it is affordable for parents, we are, we're paying the providers decent livable wages, and that the, the whole system is sustainable into the future. And can you think of any specific policy suggestions or can you point to any other models that have achieved this? Well, I mean, I mentioned the K through 12 education system before. <laughs> and so if we're looking at um, a public support of this industry, we do it with education from kindergarten on up. And so that is one possible way to do this, um, as well as to increase the funding that's going to the child care financial assistance program is one way to increase funding directly to programs so that their tuition can stay low. Um, and to do this in an ongoing way, uh, not asking them to apply for grants on every year, but to just say, we're just gonna be providing this funding so that, you know, it's sort of the idea of the stabilization money, but they need stabilization all the time. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, what, what policies or what ways forward do you see? You know, so I usually start these things with what are your guiding principles? What you want to come out of this, we entered this crisis with less resiliency than we uh, could have. And that's partly, be and it's partly because there has been a tremendous growth of inequality uh, in which um, top income households have seen their incomes rise consistently over the last 20 years. And uh, middle and especially low wage workers have seen their wages uh, stagnate or decline in real terms. And so uh, a, a, one of the, the research I do actually is about the relationship between economic inequality and economic growth. And what a lot of that evidence is telling us globally is that inequality has a negative effect on economic development and economic growth. So one of the principles should be, guiding principles should be, how, what, how can we spend this money in a way that is reducing inequality? And uh, I have looked briefly at the $400 million package that was announced um, yesterday or the day before. And 
what I see in it is is trickle down economics that you know we're giving money to businesses, but I don't see addressing the problem of inequality. And even within that package, and I, I don't want to pretend to be an expert, it, it the details are not fleshed out. Uh, so take my criticism with a grain of salt, and you know from that extract what I think should be the principles of this. But what it looked like to me was that there was a lot of uh, funding and uh, grants to large businesses. And the, the loans were to micro businesses. Now, micro businesses are the ones that are least likely to survive. They are likely, they're more likely to be led by women and people of color. Uh, and so it seems to me it should be reversed, right? That we should be offering grants to those low income, uh, to those small micro businesses and small businesses. Larger businesses have retained earnings, right? They have, a, a, they have more margin to weather these economic storms. They have better ability to get credit from banks and so forth. And I think the other thing that the, you know, that there should be qualifications on these monies to ensure that uh, workers are not disadvantaged in this process. So there are cases in which, you know, workers um, uh, uh, who, uh, who may have tested, not necessarily positive, but had contact, are furloughed from work, um, and the burden is often on them, and their income is, is lost. And I realize there are a number of income replacement problems, but we hear many stories of people falling between the cracks. So uh, at the national level, what's been done is, some, it, theoretically at least, we don't have a watchdog on this yet, but that lending to uh, large corporations shouldn't be used for bonus payments, for increased CEO pay, for share buybacks, and so forth. So there should be restrictions on how that money is used in a way that supports not only the ability of businesses to pay their, their loans and so on and so forth, but also to support their workers. Uh, and and I, I would say that, you know, for example, one of, one of the things that businesses can do during downtime uh, when we are not back to normal and they are incentivized to retain their workers is this is a great opportunity to retain and retool workers. This is what Sweden has done during crises and they've come back stronger and more resilient after crises because they've used these times to retrain and invest in their workers. What we're seeing is workers are shed. You know, they're just too costly, you're on your own. That is, that is not going to support us in a healthy recovery and to be resilient. So what I've heard so far, I'm like writing a laundry list here. Laundry list. Um, I like sort of the gender. The gender metaphor of the laundry list too. So um, workers comp and a really strong workers comp policy. That's what you're talking about. Sort of people being furloughed who are tested positive mm -hmm. would be protected by strong workers comp policy. No bonuses or um, sort of the payment from these loans going to the highest paid workers that they should go to the lower paid workers. Um, training workers and really an obligation to retain and train workers. What are other things we would want to add to that laundry list? I could see something about, you know, we have a lot of businesses that have um, played with the idea of investing in childcare or incentivize or, you know, grants for childcare from a business or something like that. Um, I would add that to the list. Robust family leave policies. What else would we want to sort of put on restrictions for these funds to really, I feel like this is a moment in history where Vermont has historically, um, especially under democratic administrations, done a fairly good job with um, sticks, basically, right? We have um, a fairly robust regulatory regime, and I think that's fabulous. And it's often a very positive regulatory regime. It leads to some very good practices in our financial industries, for instance. Um, but we have an opportunity for the first time to actually use carrots to change behavior in Vermont, which we very rarely have enough money to do. And so like, what do we want to do with the carrots? Um, Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I want to come back to that. Uh, okay. if we will, but I want to, if I can add just a couple of other things. As, yeah, uh, please. As I'm, I'm a little stuck on your question. So. Okay. Uh, Go to your own question. Uh, you know, the other things that the state could do uh, that it ha I don't see in this package is, for example, it could, you know, it could uh, address the issue of student debt. So young people who have lost their jobs now uh, are in crisis 
Mm -hmm. And uh, although the national government, there has been some suggestion of doing that, we all know what's happening at the national level. So the state could certainly do that. The state could negotiate with broadband companies to mm -hmm. cover the, uh, the communications bills of households, especially low-income households, so that they have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, I, and the other thing is, I, I really think that the state needs to look at the banking, banking and loans to businesses. Uh, there is strong evidence of discrimination against women and people of color in lending. Um, I know that the micro business uh, uh, loans that Governor Scott talked about in his $400 million package are done, done through nonprofit lenders. Uh, they they, hopefully they are less likely to discriminate uh, mm -hmm. against businesses, but the state should be monitoring this. And you know, one of the things that we know at the international level, the work that I do on gender in, in budgets at the national level is that you need to be collecting data on who's impacted by these policies. Are they gender equitable? <laughs> are, we, are we using these dollars in a way that actually promotes uh, not only uh, women-owned businesses, businesses owned by people of color, but also uh, are, are women as workers and as carers also being equitably supported by these policies? So, you know, it's kind of, you know, using what I would call an equity lens Mm -hmm. to evaluate these policies. And I would have liked to have seen that done with this $400 million package. And I, I recognize the pressure on state government right now. Uh, so I don't mean that uh, to chastise them, but I think that needs to be done. And that needs to be the lens that is used in making these decisions. And I laughed when you were speaking um, in agreement because the challenges around data and the economy and equity in Vermont are absurd um we because of our partly because of our antiquated data systems and partly because there has not been a lot of political will um we have an incredible challenge getting data disaggregated by gender and so that's something that um as a member of the commission on women um i've been really sort of like pushing in the legislature um and trying to have conversations about and really actually felt like i was making some pretty decent headway until COVID. And now all of the legislative, like the legislative work that has nothing to do with COVID has sort of fallen by the wayside and lost, lost until next biennium. And so that's, um, it's incredibly important though, because we can't make good decisions without good data. And we really don't have that good data. Well, the auditor, however, did just release a dashboard on how we are spending this money. Oh, right, right, yeah. Um, that I have not, I clicked through a few, a little bit, but did not yeah. go far enough into. And I wonder if that's a place we could get some more gender and equity data um, mm -hmm. sprinkled in. If I might just jump into, you know, we also need racially disaggregated data. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, uh, Susanna Davis mm -hmm. uh, uh, made a pitch for uh, the state government to be collecting race data on COVID. And as you saw the article recently, uh, we are like every other state in which there are disparities in, in, uh, in terms of the effects of COVID by race. Uh, so uh, I, I wanna think it's, you know, we fundamentally important that we also ramp up our uh, disaggregation of data by race. Mm -hmm. And Susanna came on the show, was that last week? Yeah. Okay, last week, she came on the show last week, um, yeah. And that was part of what we talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that drumbeat of data is one that I, it's great that you've been doing that, Emily. And I know I, I know you were having a lot of success. Um, and one of the things that I have heard when I've been in the legislature talking about this is, well, why would we collect that data when we're not? The goal of the program isn't to increase gender equity or the goal of whatever we're trying to do isn't, it's not what it's about, so why would we look at that? And, um, and one of the examples that came up at some point was the state has some goals around the environment that it uses to make decisions about contracting and other things. And you know, if, there, if it were built in to, to your process somehow, mm -hmm. that uh, equity of race, gender, age, that, that has to be considered, mm -hmm. um, and that then it would make it potentially easier to persuade people that we need to collect this data and report on it regularly. That's really interesting. There's a part of the rulemaking process um, where sort of at the end, there's an addendum that's kind of um, done by rote sometimes, but sometimes not. And I think that's where it asks sort of 
what are the implications for the, is this what you're talking about, Carrie? Yeah. There's what are the implications for the environment? What are the implications for the public education system and a few yeah. other categories? And if it was, what are the implications for gender and racial equity? Um, that would be a really, that's a really interesting place to sneak this all in. That is, uh, I, you know, as someone who is not a policymaker, I find what Carrie just said fascinating because to me, I think one of the things you do when you create policy is you're, you're creating something that's going to impact human beings. And so to judge whether that policy is working or not, you want to see the impacts on your community. <laughs> and so why aren't we collecting data on, on women, on people of color, on the environment, on equity? I mean, on all of it. Because how else can we judge whether this policy is working or not? So I have to admit, as a non-policymaker, I just had a little bit of, wait a minute, no, no. <laughs> so I would love to see this data being collected. It seems like something that needs to be happening. Mm -hmm. We'll get there someday. Someday. Mm -hmm. Maybe even, maybe this is the place to spend all of that money, right? One of the places. Um, mm -hmm. Emily, going back to your question, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what else could be done, you know, sort of as conditionality yeah. is the terminology that's often used at the international level on these mm -hmm. kind of uh, endeavors. Uh, one is that, uh, and I, I can't necessarily be more specific, but to ensure that workers don't have to make a choice between their health and work, mm -hmm. right? I, when, the things that I'm hearing are about people, especially in low wage jobs who are forced to go to work because they, they are so poor and they can't afford to lose that income. Yep. And uh, this, is, this is a public health issue, uh, but it is also, I think, you know, uh, an ethical issue as well mm -hmm. that in this particular time, people shouldn't have to make that choice and employers shouldn't be forcing workers to make that choice. So there should be maximum flexibility for uh, parents especially, but certainly all of us to not have to choose between an income or our health and ultimately community health. Thank you. That is, oh. no, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say that's an incredibly hard one. And I absolutely agree with you. And when I look back on the conversation that was playing itself out maybe two months ago, when the federal um, benefit was added to unemployment insurance and how terrified people were that unemployment was going to pay more than some low wage jobs and how people thought that was like, you know, we were going to have a new crop of, you know, Vermont welfare queens, which never existed in the first place and certainly were not, you know, um, just the idea that people only go to work, that people who only go to work for money should keep on going to work no matter what. Um, and that assumption that's really built into very much our New England politic and how to upend that to put sort of health and prosperity and community resilience first rather than second is the cultural shift for that is enormous. Can I jump in? <laughs> uh, you know, this mantra of follow the science and talking about COVID, yeah. we should apply that to economic policy. As that would well. be fabulous. The research tells us <laughs> that welfare payments do not reduce work effort. No, That's of course not. That's what the research says. Yeah. So I know these, I, you know, I grew up in New England. I know these old New England, you know, things about frugality and work ethic and so forth, but they are inconsistent mm -hmm. with the evidence. And, uh, and uh, you, know, especially, you know, especially this notion of an extra $600 uh, keeping people from wanting to go back to work. First of all, work is deeply meaningful to people. That is part of our identity. So this is simply a flawed assumption. And if it is flawed, then we need to out it as a flawed assumption and bring to bear the research evidence that shows that it is inaccurate, uh, as we do with COVID and managing COVID. Uh, yeah, you know, and I, I, this is a little bit apart from this discussion, but let me just say this, that often the people who might take advantage of that extra $600 to not go back to work is because that work is not dignified. Yep. That work is dangerous, it's not dignified, and people, and, and it is uh, monotonous and dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the importance of treating workers better to bring them into the, 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 the work process so that their productivity is enhanced. It's in the interest of employers to treat workers better as well, and we know that when they do, that worker productivity rises. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to upend in terms of our false assumptions, 
But uh, again, I will say, follow the science. The, we have profound research evidence on, on, these, on these things. And um, I'm gonna just add one more thing here. You know, this is especially the case for single moms who 25% roughly of all Vermont children live in single parent households. So if they are not doing well, we as a state are not doing well because those kids are facing the trauma of financial distress that has negative effects on their cognitive abilities and their lifelong learning and productivity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, this notion that somehow workers are lazy, this notion of welfare moms and so forth is absolutely inaccurate. And I just, I, I hope we return to the day where we get, begin again to challenge those false assumptions and to predicate public policy on the research, not on false myths that have been perpetuated for too long by people who have never had the experience of staying home and taking care of kids and living on a subpar wage. I'll just give you an example right now. University of Vermont is, uh, is going to reduce the, um, the workload of non-tenure track faculty yep. who are the lowest paid, many of them women, by 25%. And there was a piece recently in the paper about one of these lecturers whose wage will now fall below a living wage. And she will now be, as a mom, a single mom with kids, also looking for another job in order to su supplement her income. Uh, so, you know, we need to do better in, in these things. And again, I'm just going to return to the fact that this is an investment in the long-term health of the state. We need to revise the discussion and understand that supporting people and families leads is an investment in people that we all benefit from. It is an investment that pays for itself in the future. And the problem is, is that when we fail to invest, the costs are invisible to us because they extend over a range of years. So we have this policy myopia in which we focus you know, critically on uh, what the budget is today, mm -hmm. but ignore the long run impacts of any budgetary decisions that we make. Thank you. Um, Thank you. As a, someone who was a single mother and bartending to pay my bills, I like, I feel this very, you know, it's very resonant personally. Um, and then politically, our inability to move beyond a two year cycle and into a 20 year, 40 year, 50 year cycle is debilitating to the state as a whole. Um, we've seen really recent evidence of exactly what you're describing that we've seen, you know, academics studying for decades is very clear that people work um, regardless of what the benefits given by the state are. But the conversation around um, hazard pay that started in the Senate and got some real legs and passed out of the Senate was partly predicated on this idea that we need to bring workers pay up to par with unemployment because we were scared that people were going to leave work in droves. But in fact, people did not. Most of those people stayed in their jobs. And now, um, unfortunately, that's become an argument against the essential worker bonus, <laughs> um, which is, you know, the kind of logic that we get ourselves stuck in if we're only thinking in these two month periods instead of really thinking out about what would it mean to make sure that folks who are at the bottom of the economic pile have dignity with their work and respect something more than you know the National Guard flying over the workplace and is more like having enough money to you know fully feed their family and not be living in chronic stress we are, thank you for that, Emily. We are out of time. Oh. So I just wanted to quickly, I know, right? See, this is how these conversations go. They're so yummy. Um, but before we go, I want to check in with Carrie and, and Stephanie to see if there's anything you wanted to add uh, before we, we head out. Um, I think I just want to echo everything that's been said already. And I think that the, um, as long as, one of the important things to consider when we're thinking about how to spend this money or how to restructure things or how we're going to come out of this is that uh, we have people people have needs and um, there is really the whole point of government is to meet the needs of the people that live here and so to have that be the guiding idea rather than there's a math problem that we have to solve and we have to make all the numbers add up the way we want to and but to approach it first from what is it that people need um, 
I think that will have a much better success in the long run. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, I want to just speak to this um, this last issue uh, it, sort of more generally. You know, I think that we have a bias in uh, in Vermont and in the country in which somehow giving money to businesses is acceptable. We trust them to do the right thing with that money, but somehow to give money to middle and low income families is somehow uh, encouraging laziness. The uh, stopped in California. Uh, adopted a basic, uh, a universal basic income experiment in which they gave, I think it was $500 extra a month to some uh, number of families. And what they found was those families spent that money on food, on essentials for the family. And I think that, uh, that we have to revise that discourse. I, 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 we have to come back to the fact that over the last 25 years, the overwhelming majority of growth of of GDP in the United States has gone to the top households. And so we are in a position in which there is a great deal of inequality that will negatively affect our economic future. Addressing inequality should be central to any policies and uh, positions taken by the government and any spending done in response to COVID. We have an opportunity to address one of our severest problems in this state as well as nationally if we adopt that lens and recognize that if we want to come out of this more, with more resilient, then we need to address the problem of inequality. Thanks. Thank you. Emily, any last thoughts and how can people find you if they have questions? I am really looking forward to taking this conversation and trying to make it real um, in policy. And I, the idea of addressing inequality should be um, the first priority of any good policy, especially in this time, is... I think something that can't be said enough. And um, I think we will all keep on saying it. So thank you for that. People can find me at emilykornheiser.org, ekornheiser at gmail.com, ekornheiser at ledge.state.vt.us every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. in a Zoom community town hall with the two other Brattleboro representatives. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can even call me on the telephone if you want. <laughs> Thank you. This has been the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW LP Brattleboro 107.7. I am your host, Olga Peters. I want to thank Carrie Brown, the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, for joining us today, as well as Professor Stephanie Seguino from the Department of Economics at UVM and also who is a fellow at the Gund Institute for the Environment. And I want to leave everyone with this thought. I want us all in Vermont to challenge our notion of scarcity and our mindset and this belief that if someone else gets something, we're going to get less. Because I think that is a cultural shift we need to make. Because it should not be a point of pride when we tell ourselves jokes like, what do you call a Vermonter with only three jobs? Lazy. We take that as a point of pride, but it really tells us that the system isn't working. So I want everyone to enjoy their weekend and see us back here next week at 2 p.m. on WVEW, or you can find us at the Vermont 2 Facebook page or the Vermont 2 SoundCloud page. Take care, everyone. <laughs>